following message is presented by Community Gospel Church in Bremen, Indiana. It is our great privilege to share this ministry with you. We in no way intend for this to be a replacement for the local church. It is our prayer that this would serve as a resource to help make Jesus Christ known in our congregation and other congregations gathering across the world. For more information about Community Gospel Church, visit www.communitygospelchurch.com. Thanks, Bethany. If you would, grab your Bible or electronic device, open up to Acts. Chapter 27 is where we're going to be at today. We are two chapters away from being done with the book of Acts. Isn't that amazing? We've gone through almost 28 chapters of the book of Acts. We've stopped a little bit and had the opportunity to just kind of see some things. But Acts chapter 27 is where we're going to be at today. We're going to skip the first 12 verses and go into verse 13. Really interesting passage of scripture, Acts chapter 27 is. Um, I preach out of the ESV version of the Bible, and if you have a New Living Translation, say, version of the Bible, uh, it's going to be a little bit different wording-wise. We also found out this morning uh, that our pew Bibles are the NIV Bibles from like the 80s, and so if you have, uh, which a lot of good things happened in the 80s, specifically one thing in 1982, but... um, But, and uh, yeah, Sarah was born then, absolutely. Um, but uh, the NIV was revised in uh, 2011, so there might be some different wording there too as well, okay? So Acts chapter 27. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I first came to know Jesus, I thought life would be kind of like a carnival cruise, amen? Like I thought we were going to have a lot of good times and things were going to be okay, and I was sitting here next to Becky, and then uh, the more I walked with Jesus, the more I started to realize that walking with Jesus is kind of like a free ticket to the Titanic, amen? (laughs) And then uh, the more I realized that Jesus wants to walk with me, it's kind of like living in an endless season of lost. Uh, I just don't know what's going on or who the main characters are supposed to be. I just get a little bit frustrated. You ever been there with Jesus where you look at him and you're like, hey, can you kind of enlighten me to some of the things that you're doing in my life? Because that would be more beneficial than me just walking and wandering around, amen? Amen. All right, so we're on the same page today. Anyway, uh, suffering and difficulties are a part of life. You know, Becky sits up here and uh, she gave an update on just her condition and where she's at. And we shouldn't be surprised about these things, right? We, we shouldn't be surprised when Satan wants to put his talons in our lives and kind of frustrate things a little bit. It shouldn't shock us a whole lot. See, in Acts chapter 27, we realize that our friend, the Apostle Paul, is present. And what we've seen from Paul is that Jesus has just radically transformed his life. If you uh, were to read Paul's letters that he gave to the church, specifically one to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, he says that he received 39 lashes from his fellow brothers and sisters over five times. It also says in that passage that he was multiple, uh, uh, multiple times he was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead, shipwrecked in constant danger, sleepless nights. And if you uh, want to think about this on a new level, it is that he uh, also had the pressure to keep the church moving in the proper direction. You know, I think sometimes we think that we have it bad, but we forget just how hard it was to start something like this church or the church in general, or just continue on in a relationship with Jesus. But if we were to bring Paul up and we were to sit him down, he would look at us and he would say, listen, it is always worth it. It's always worth it. In a relationship with Jesus, it's always worth going through the times of trial and the times of tribulation. He would say, I learned more about God in the seasons of distress than I ever did in the seasons when things were okay. And that's what Paul's kind of main message to us is, is that I don't want you to be mediocre. I want you to be great for the kingdom of God. But that's got to come through some pain. It's got to come through some trials and some tribulations. So how did we get here in Acts 27? And if it's like your first Sunday, you're like, did I miss the first 26? Am I completely lost? Don't worry, we'll catch you up real fast, all right? Paul is this guy who essentially used to persecute the church, and now he populates the church. He got saved, uh, and what I mean by saved is he confessed with his mouth that he was a sinner. 
and believed Jesus was his savior on the road to Damascus because Jesus confronted him and he says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, you're Jesus. And he says, that's right. He says, I don't know. I don't have really a good idea. I didn't think that you were going to come and visit me, but you did. Jesus always comes to us in weird ways, doesn't he? He always shows up at my door at times when I don't really want him the most. It's kind of like the UPS guy, right? I just got up and he's at my door. He wants to give me a package. And I'm like, I don't have time for this, right? Just leave it at the door. But he's like, no, I got to hand this off to you. And see, <clears throat> Paul realizes that when Jesus shows up, he does something massive. And as Jesus works in his life, Paul has problems because here's what transpires. He goes to the temple, which is where the Jews gathered at the day, and He's helping a brother out by going through some of these Old Testament kind of uh, rituals that they would go through so that he would understand Jesus the way that he knew Jesus. And the Jews catch wind of this and they grab him and they say, in an exaggerated state, you're preaching everywhere to everyone about this Jesus. And they were wrong. Paul wasn't preaching everywhere to everyone, but some people, right? And they were against him because they essentially said, you are against the Old Testament, which wasn't true. Because Paul says, I want to show you how Jesus is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. But sometimes, ready for this, sometimes people get so stuck in their ways that it's hard to get through their thick skulls. Amen? It's like teaching an old dog some new tricks. I have a little puppy and I can teach him anything. Well, kind of. He's a basset hound. He doesn't learn real well. <clears throat> but the older we get, the harder it is to learn something new. Amen? If you think that change is easy... Here's the deal. When you go home today, I want you, when you sit down for dinner, to sit at somebody else's place at the table. And you'll learn real quick how hard it is for people to change. And Paul knew that, so he's trying to help a brother out. And the Jews got really angry with him. They were mad at him. But the real root problem with the Jews against Paul was they were jealous. Because he had something that they so desperately wanted. And so they throw him to the authorities and they essentially say, hey, you deal with them. And so they walk through all these um, processes in regards to legality issues. And they put him up in front of people and all the legal people, they can't find anything wrong with Paul. They're like, I think you're innocent. He's like, I know. And the whole time he just keeps telling people about Jesus, which makes them even more mad. And so he goes from one level to the next level to the next level in verse, or chapter 26 we realize that Paul says, I'm a Roman citizen. I'm going to go to the Supreme Court of the time period, which is uh, Caesar. And they're like, all right, we're going to send you to Rome. And the craziest part about the book of Acts is God told Paul that he would preach the gospel to Rome, and he's never been there before. But the path to get to Rome is paved with trials and tribulations. And so that's where we land here in Acts chapter 27, is that Paul is kind of en route to Rome, and he is stuck on a cruise ship with a bunch of other prisoners that doesn't have any meals on it. And all of these guys are going to this place, and they're going to Italy, and the route is not quick and easy. And in the last verse before Acts 13, it says that Paul warned the crew that they should not go ahead to the island that they're going. And as good Roman citizens do, they ignore his advice. And that's where we land in Acts chapter 27, verse 13. Let's pray real quick, ask God's blessing upon his word. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thanks for the text and the ability to walk through the text this past week with you is amazing. And I think there's some really good truths here that we need to grasp a hold of in regards to when we head for deep waters. Paul in the text, God is not going to want to go willingly, but he has to go. And he learns lessons there, but so do the other people who are in attendance. And so God put us on the boat today and help us to learn here from this text on how trials and tribulations help formulate who we need to be, not necessarily who we want to be. And help us to gain truths from this text that we don't just put inside of ourselves to puff up ourselves so that we would have this knowledge so that we have it, but so that we would go and share it. And so that we would have the opportunity to make your son Jesus known as we communicate it, not with just our mouths, but with our hands and our feet as well. God, I love you. I pray a blessing on this word. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would speak in ways that I can today. 
to the people who are present here. It's in your name that we pray. Amen? All right, Acts 13. Here we go. Buckle up. <clears throat> now, when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they, being the crew, weighted anchor. Now, there's like 20 anchors on this boat, okay? If we're, we're going to walk through this text, and you're going to see there's like one anchor after another anchor after another anchor after another anchor. You're like, how many do you have on this ship? But they got a lot, all right? And they sailed along the line of Crete close to the shore. 14, but soon a tempestuous, praise the Lord, I got that one right. Because <clears throat> I kept saying tempest uh, all week long, tempestuous wind called the Northeasterner struck down from the land. Verse 15, and when the ship was caught and could not face that wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Did you catch the word we in there? Luke is our author. He is the man who penned the gospel of Luke. Okay, Acts is the second part of Luke. Luke is believed to be with him on the boat. All right, so he has a first-hand account of what's going on. This happens a lot in Acts. First, Luke is with Paul, then he leaves Paul, then he comes back to Paul. Now, what is transpiring here is what's taking place. Winds in that type of year in the Mediterranean Sea may travel on the sea extremely difficult. Well, unexpected, this captain should have known better. Uh, we've been to Israel, and uh, what we know is in the Sea of Galilee, uh, the weather can change dramatically there. And that's why a lot of times you'll see in the New Testament that Jesus and his disciples get caught up in some really rough storms. Because there's all these mountain ridges, and there's these uh, different elevation changes, and what happens is that weather will dramatically change fast, and then you'll be caught in a storm and you won't know why. So it will look like very clear weather, but then in reality it can get worse at the change of a uh, drop. I was going to say drop of a hat, but whatever. Wind from the north came down off the mountains. Okay, It mixes with the south winds of Crete. And Luke uses this word tempestuous, which is where we get our English word typhoon. Okay, So typhoon, typhoon lagoon. Opposing air currents essentially whirl, and now all of a sudden the wind blows, and it pushes the boat in one direction out into the sea. That's the worst thing that could ever happen. You think that the weather's going to be good, and all of a sudden the wind comes out of nowhere, and it pushes you out to sea, and you realize that you're going in a way that you didn't want to go. So what do we do? 16, first attempt. The sailors realize this. And they run under the lee, and that word in the ESV just means shelter, of a small island called Cada. We, again Luke speaking here, managed with difficulty to, to, to secure the ship's boat. You know what they're talking about there? The lifeboat. Okay? So they're going to bring the lifeboat first thing on board and make sure that that is secure. Then the second thing they're going to do is they're going to band the ship together with ropes to make sure that it doesn't break up. And then they're going to lower, ready for this, another anchor. <laughs> they got a million of them. Look at this, verse 17. After hoisting that lifeboat up, they used supports to undergird the ship. There's the ropes, that binding. And fearing that they would run aground onto Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Now, why would they do that? If you drop the anchor, you're essentially hoping that the boat drags on the ground and stays close to the shore. And so that's kind of their main thing. So the attempt is to prepare for the worst. Then they realize that doesn't work. Verse 18. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to what is called jettison the cargo. This is where you save the women and children but throw off the food. And the crew is desperate, so they throw off some extra sails maybe, they throw off some yards, maybe. And in absolute desperation, we realize here in the text, uh, on the third day, they threw the tackle overboard with their own hands. To make matters worse, keep walking in the text. Verse 20. When neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days, there was no small tempest or no small storm that lay upon us. All hope was being lost. Your navigational system goes out. This is when you're driving in the car and your GPS goes out, right? And you don't have a navigational system and you realize that you have to rely on the other lady in the car that knows where she's going. Amen, gentlemen? 
I didn't realize uh, when we first got a GPS, she started talking to me. I had two women in the car, and then my prayer life really picked up. Amen? Whatever. <clears throat> this is the cruise navigational system. The sun and the stars is how they get places, and we realized the clouds had covered up the stars, so they don't know. They have no idea where they're going. They're being drug out to sea, and they're lightening the loads, and they are in complete loss of hope. Where's Paul go? Because Paul's not here. Man goes to secure his own secular fortune while Paul goes to pray. Man is worried about what he has that is worldly, but Paul, as we'll see in the text, retreats to pray. Where did he learn that from? In Luke chapter 5, it says that Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness to pray. But we have to do this, but we need to do that. But we forget to pray. We forget to plead to the Lord here. You ever heard uh, the term measure twice, cut once? Yeah, I never followed that direction, and so all my cabinets are crooked, right? But what we realize here is uh, we should pray twice, then preach. We should pray twice, then practice. These guys are so worried about saving their stuff, Paul's more worried about serving his Savior. Are you like that? Because Paul goes down into the boat to resort to pray and realizes that's where he finds the presence of God. The first lesson that we learn here is that the presence of God comes when we acknowledge him through prayer. What is the storm that you got in your life? What is the thing that you're facing in your life, the trial and tribulation that you're going through? And ask the honest question. Just think about it. Have you really, truly prayed about it? Have you really, truly sought the Lord and prayed about it? I had a buddy of mine the other day, and uh, we were sitting there, and he wasn't eating lunch. And me being the moron that I am, I looked at him, and I said, why aren't you eating lunch? You fasting or something? And he's like, yeah, actually, I am. Oh. <laughs> so why do you fast? He said, because I got a really important decision coming up, and I need to skip a meal or two to make sure that I honor the Lord and seek him before I eat. Do we seek the Lord in prayer and find his presence there? It's amazing here that God is going to speak to Paul the more he pushes forward in prayer. And watch this. It starts to kick up. Verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time. I do not recommend this. Paul is going to speak to some hangry individuals. They need a Snickers bar or something because they haven't had anything. And Paul stands up among them and he says to them, men, you should have listened to me when I told you the first time. That is not good advice. Okay, I don't know how you are with people, but if I run into you and it's like noon, I don't look at you and say, hey, guys, you did things wrong before I got here. That's not good advice. But he does. He's Paul and I am not. And so that's OK. He says, you should have listened to me when you set sail from Crete. But instead, you incurred this injury and loss. Verse 22. Now, I urge you to take heart. Where does he get that? <laughs> Did you know that Moses tells Joshua before he takes over for leadership? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. Take heart. If God goes with me, understand that his presence is also in this place. Sometimes you're going to do things for the Lord and he's going to save people that are around you. And you're going to wonder why he would do that. But it's not for your understanding. It's for his glory. Men, you should take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> for this very night. Now he's going to talk crazy. Paul, you haven't eaten either. There stood before me an angel of God whom I belong and whom I worship. And that angel said to me what Moses said to Joshua, what the Bible says 365 times because you need one for each day. Do not worry. Don't be afraid. When the storm rages on, we need somebody to say, don't be afraid. And Paul gets it from Jesus. And Paul you stand before Caesar, he says. 
You must do these things. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So he says it again. Verse 23, take heart, men, for I have found faith in God. It will be exactly as I told you, but. That always cracks me up in the Bible. Jesus does that to me all the time. Does he do that to you? Jordan, you have to do this, but. But what? But you need to run aground on some island. I think there was a guy there who was sarcastic that said no, duh. Right? That's just logical, Paul. That makes sense. But here, Paul rises to the surface. A very famous commentator, his name is Warren Worsby, said that trials and tribulations, crises, don't make a person. A crisis just simply shows a person what they're made of. And here we realize that that tends to bring true leadership to the forefront. Paul, when he is faced with the problem, his leadership just continues to increase. I love what Bruce Lee said. He said, don't pray for an easy life. Pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. I don't think Bruce Lee knew Jesus, but he was close in that quote. We shouldn't, as believers, pray that our lives are easy. We should pray for difficult lives that reveal our true leadership, where we're at, where we need to go, and where God is working. When you've been with God, you lead according to his word. But the only prerequisite to proclaim salvation is that you know him as Lord and Savior. And oftentimes, listen to me, church, you're not preaching into your storm because you think you don't have the qualifications. I don't have a seminary degree. I don't have all the Bible knowledge that you have, Pastor Jordan, or maybe some mentor that you have in your life. But you have the word of God in front of you. You have more resources available to you. And you can preach into the storm the second that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have to wait. Sometimes the only thing that you need to preach into a storm is, I know Jesus and that's enough. So you got to look at your storm and say, listen, I know the Lord and that's the start. He's going to work in and through this situation and this circumstance. As the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 51, verse 15, unseal my lips, Lord, that my mouth will praise you. Sometimes we just have to tell Jesus, thanks for putting this difficult thing in my life, even though it's causing me a massive amount of pain. And here, Paul is essentially preaching at the storm. And what's happening is he is truly, truly encouraging the people. When you preach to your storm, you encourage somebody else who has a different storm. When you start preaching about what's going on in your life, you understand that you're helping somebody else out. So we have to get to the point to proclaim God's word into the storms that manifest themselves into our life. That's why we read our Bible every single morning. That's why we pick it up. I'm going to give you some resources later on in the sermon, so just hang on for a second. But look at this. At least three times, God gave Paul an encouragement to be a message so that he would put other people's minds at ease. He spent time with God in prayer, and he knew that God saw the trouble and held the future. 1 Peter 3, verse 4. Praise be to the God in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Into an inheritance that can never spoil or fade. The inheritance is kept for you in heaven. So here's like the real kicker of the story. We head to deep waters, first of all, because it helps us identify really what's in focus, and that's the finish line. Every trial and tribulation that you face helps you focus a little bit on the fact that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. It's just going to be temporary. It's just going to last for a little moment. Is it going to be painful? Absolutely. But you got to focus on the finish line that this world is not our home. In 2 Corinthians, Paul continues, he says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs all of them. So, here's the push. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on not what is seen, but is what is unseen, that which is eternal. Storms cannot shipwreck you unless you let them shipwreck you. Trials and tribulations cannot sideline you unless you let them sideline you. Some of the reason that you have anxiety over an issue is because you're focused on that which is present instead of that which is eternal. 
Sometimes the reason that we're so worried is because we're thinking about tomorrow instead of thinking about eternity. See, I got to focus on the finish line, that he is doing a great work in me. Verse 27. <clears throat> but when the 14th night, <laughs> some problems last a day, some problems last two days, some problems last a week, some problems last two weeks, some problems never go away. Do you know Paul prayed pretty much his whole life that God would remove the thorn that was in his side? I think it was a person. And God, does, he doesn't remove it. Some things you will go through for your whole life. So encouraging today I am. As we're being driven across the Adriatic Sea, <clears throat> about midnight. Now, here's what we would do, right? Come on, jump in this boat, church. Here's what we would do at midnight. We're going to essentially bring some people in. And the sailors suspected that they were kneeling land. So they get up. They're like, hey, you want to go up? You want to go upstairs? You want to escape? Yeah, I want to escape. You want to escape? Yeah, me too. Okay, let's go. So here's what they do. So they took a surrounding and found 20 fathoms. What in the world is a fathom? Here's what a fathom is. Ready for this? Ready for this? It's from the tip of your finger to the other tip of your finger. When you spread your arms apart. And why would they do that? Because they didn't have tape measures back then, church. Okay? So it's about five to six feet, depending on how tall you are. And they would have uh, said that a fathom is essentially uh, the length of a fully grown man. So they didn't do that with children or anybody else who are short. And if you're short, I'm sorry. 29, fearing that we might run along the, lo uh, the rocks, they let down what? Another four anchors. Where are you getting all this weight? Here's what you need to throw off the boat is the anchors and the stems. And they prayed for the day to come. In other words, they waited for it to become morning. Verse 30, and the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship. I want to go. Yeah, I want to go. Let's go. Okay, let's go. And they lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying the anchors from the bow. Try not to be loud. Okay, I'm trying not to be loud. These anchors are really heavy. I know. I'm sorry. Why don't you throw them overboard? You throw them overboard. Shh. Dad's going to be so mad. 31. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. There's always, always, always some Bible beaten believer that is awake in the middle of the night. You ever been on a youth trip? You know what I'm talking about? It never fails. Those of you who grew up in church, we knew this, right? I want to go outside for a while. Yeah, I want to go outside for a while. Hey, what are you kids doing? <laughs> what are you doing, Bob? Reading your Bible or something? Go to bed. Man, I always never knew when those guys slept. Okay, anyway, sidetracked. Paul said, verse 31, to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. I can't believe he's awake. What is he doing? He's praying. No kidding. We just said that. 32. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, the lifeboat. Okay? And then what happened is it went or it left and they let it go. So here's what transpires and here's what happens here in the text. Okay? They got caught. Paul essentially gave a command, the centurion, because remember, if you're a Roman soldier, you have authority over these individuals. And he listens to what Paul says, because now Paul is starting to gain some credibility in the world. And he says, listen, we should listen to this guy. And they cut the lifeboat off and they let it go. Now the whole crew, ready for this, is underneath the authority of Paul. The secular society has lost all of their leadership credentials, and now Paul has taken control of the ship. You can lead from the bottom. You do not have to be placed at the top. You think so often that you, just because you work a line of a factory, means that you have no leadership authority. Sometimes the guy who's the most silent in the room has the most leadership influence. It's the way it works. We think so oftentimes that we have to be appointed to a position, but God has already placed us in a position, and that is first of all to pray, then to preach, then to proclaim his promises. And that's what Paul does. He says if God promised it, he will do it, and he will do it over and over and over again. So as the day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all, verse 33, to take some food. You all need some food. Here you go. Today is the 14th day. Two weeks have passed that you continue in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you, take some food, for it will give you strength. 
Now watch how much these guys listen to Paul. I love this passage of scripture. He says, not a hair on your head will perish from any one of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, pointed back to God's promises, gave thanks. There's your reason to pray for your lunch and your dinner and all those other things right there. He broke it, he began to eat, and they all were encouraged. Paul's showing God's promises are coming true. And it encourages people when you proclaim that God's word does exactly what it says it's going to do. They were encouraged. They took food for themselves. About 276 people were there in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, what did they do? They believed Paul's words so much that they throw out the rest of the food. They get rid of it. They're starting to trust that God has a plan. And let's lighten this a little bit more because he's going to save us. Let's go ahead and put the rest of this over the boat. Because not only does God have a promise, but he also has a purpose. How does this story end? We got to finish this up. <clears throat> now, when it was day, they didn't recognize the land. <clears throat> but they noticed a bay on a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. That's what Paul said. Remember, you got to put it on land. And so they cast off <laughs> more anchors. <laughs> It cracks me up. There's a thousand of them in here. And he left them at the sea at the same time, loosening the ropes and untied the rudders, hoisting the foresail to the wind they made for the beach. Now, this is an all out dash. Things are getting tense. Here we go. We're going to head for the beach. And so uh, the, the boat starts moving in the right direction. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground, which means they ran into some rocks. And the bow struck and remained immovable. They're not at land yet. And the stern was being broken up. What's happening and transpiring? Do you know? The ship's not going to be saved. What did Paul say? That which is secular isn't going to make it ashore. But that which is secure to the Lord will, which is us, his servants. The soldier's plan was to kill their prisoners. Why would they do that? Because if the prisoners uh, die, then surely they can account for them. Then they won't die. But if the prisoners run free, then they have a problem. They'll be killed too as well. Verse 43. The centurion, the one that was over Paul, wanted to save Paul because now he believed in the promises that Paul preached. He kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could not swim to jump overboard first, or could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. Verse 44. And the rest on planks like the Titanic. Jack. Jack. If you haven't seen the movie, you're not missing out on anything. <clears throat> on planks or pieces of the ship, went into the shore. And so it was that what? All were brought safely to land. What do you think the first thing Paul preached when he got to shore was? God has a purpose. God definitely has a promise. I know this because I sought him out according to his word because I spoke to him days ago. See, deep water doesn't just keep the finish line in focus, but it also cements our confidence in Christ. It also shows us that Jesus is the rock of our salvation. And on him, when we put ourselves on that rock, while other things might be sinking sand, he's the strength that we have to stand. The storm can rage on, but we realize here is a purpose. I don't know if you want to take these notes, but I'm going to give this to you. Um, let me give you just... Five chapters in the Bible that speak to the storms in your life. And what I would do this week, just as kind of a next step to this sermon, is on Monday read this first chapter, Tuesday read the next chapter, Wednesday read the next chapter, Thursday read the next chapter, Friday need to read the next chapter, Saturday just recap them all. These are the five chapters in the Bible that I think are so amazingly influential in regards to those of us who have storms in our life. The first one I see is Romans chapter 8. See, because what happens is people look at me and they say, Jordan, I don't know where to go in God's word. I don't know really where to place uh, that uh, finger to point at in the text. Romans chapter 8 is the confidence we have in being called children of God. If you want to know what it's like to be called a believer in Jesus Christ, Romans 8 is the chapter for you. Key verse, Romans 8 verse 29. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many and brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. The last verse is so important. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. God calls us into a relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ, the son. When he calls you into that relationship, he justifies you from your sin. You are no longer a slave. Now you're a free man or woman, and you can worship the Lord until the point where he calls you home, and you will be glorified when we die, when we see Jesus. What happens is he says that old body's just a house, and here, let me give you a new one, and he puts us in a new temple, and we praise Jesus for the rest of our lives. And if you think that's boring, you got bad theology because it's going to be amazing. I can't wait until I reach glorification. So salvation is coming to Christ. And what we realize is when he justifies us, he works through us, which sanctifies us or sets us apart to be called his children so that we will be glorified. Second one. So Monday, Romans 8, Tuesday, John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is the confidence we have in Jesus being our shepherd, that his ways are better than your ways. For this reason, in John chapter 10, verse 17, it says, This is why Jesus loves us. He laid down his life so that he may take it up again. He has the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. This is a charge that I received from my father. And what that verse is essentially saying is, ready for this? What God chooses to do is what God chooses to do. And it is for your good, whether you like it or not. You've got to accept it. Does it make sense all the time? And here is the best part, I think, about being a believer. You ready for this? Jesus lets me question. Jesus lets me ask questions because Jesus asks questions. Jesus in the garden, he says, God, why does this have to happen to me? If there's any way that you could remove this cup, that'd be great. But he says, I can have confidence in the fact that God knows what he's doing. Monday, Romans 8. Tuesday, John 10. Wednesday, 1 John chapter 3. The confidence that you have in keeping the faith, that it's worth it. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Two greatest commandments. You should love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Who's my neighbor? Anyone who has a need in which I am able to meet. Who is my God? The one who sent Jesus Christ as a salvation, not a condemnation. Okay? Friday, or Thursday, Ephesians chapter 7. Love this chapter in the Bible. The confidence we have when called to help others. If Jesus encourages us, ready for this? You should be encouraging somebody else. In the storms and trials and tribulations in your life, whether that's cancer, whether that's uh, hardships with your job, marriage problems, raising kids problems, whatever is going on, Ephesians chapter 7 just screams at the fact that you can have confidence in being encouraged in your relationship with Christ while encouraging others. Last one, Friday. Psalm chapter uh, 103. The confidence that we have in knowing that God loves us. You need this in your life right now. Ready? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, who heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He abounds in love. He will not always chill, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For do not repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is to the west, so does he remove our transgressions from us. As a further show of compassion to his children, the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our future. He remembers that we're dust. 
As man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like the flowers of the field, for the wind passes over it, and then it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But steadfast is the love of the Lord from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. It's an infinite love for those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over it all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word. Obey his voice and obey his word. Bless the Lord, all the hosts, his ministers, those of you who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We sing out hallelujah and we call out to you in times of distress. And we can say, because we have a relationship with you, great is the Lord who is worthy to receive honor who is worthy because he is powerful. And if you find yourself here in this sanctuary this morning, or if you're listening online, however you got to this place, and you do not have a relationship with God because you've never placed your faith and trust in him through faith, today is that day. The purpose of community gospel is to make Jesus Christ known both near and far. And the way in which you come to know Christ is you confess that you're a sinner. You missed the standard. You did something that totally marred the image of who you are with your great God, the creator. And you say, I know I'm a sinner. I realize I'm a sinner. And I need a savior. I need somebody else. If you confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is your Savior, the Bible says that you will be saved. Do not make it more complicated than it has to be. Paul will write a letter to the Ephesians and he will say to them, it is by grace, God's grace, that you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we place our faith and trust in Christ. If that's you today, you don't have a relationship with God, you simply say, God, I do need you. I believe I'm a sinner and I want a relationship with your son, Jesus. And I know so many of you who are gathered here today know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I know you've made the best decision ever. And I don't know all the storms that are going on in your life. But I know the start of speaking into the storms is speaking to the ones who know those storms exist. And it starts with just humbly saying, God, I need you. I need your help. I need you to come and to work. I need you to show me in your word how I can speak back to this storm so that my worries go away. I need to relinquish control today, God, back to you to realize you're moving in my life. That yours is a plan not of condemnation, but of salvation. And you're working for the good of those who love you. And God, help me to rest on your promises and your purposes. For they're better than my own. Lord Jesus, we need that in our lives. It's a promise that you chose to fulfill for us, to point us back to the fact that your word never fails, that your plans always prosper. And so conform our will to yours, conform our lives to yours, conform our being to yours for the ultimate purpose so that we could proclaim the excellencies of you who have called us out of darkness into glorious light so that people who are far from you will come to know you And so people that know you will be encouraged to continue to stay strong in the battle that rages on until you come to call us home. We long for the day in which you come to call us home. We lay all these things at your feet. Help us to sleep in that boat just like you did. And to know that you're in control as we go out and be sent out 
into the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Community Gospel Church podcast. If you would like to support this ministry financially, simply log on to communitygospelchurch.com and click the Contribute tab.